once during my first year as a monk, John Fu made the comment that sometimes you hear people describe in the path as one of letting go, just letting go. He said, remember, it's not just letting go, it's also developing. At the time I didn't have any notion of what he was talking about, or at least I had only a partial notion of what he was talking about. But you find that as you live with the teaching, as you live with the path, you realize it can't just be letting go. You've got to develop things. Because if you're just letting go, often it's letting go out of aversion, letting go out of a desire to run away and not want to do any work. And that kind of letting go is not healthy. Before you let go of anything, you have to develop it, work at it, so that when you let go, you let go out of understanding. You let go not out of aversion, but simply a sense of having had enough, out of a sense of fullness. For instance, we know that we're going to have to let go of the body let go of attachment to the body. But what's the first thing you focus on when you meditate? You focus on the breath. It's part of the body. And you're not just letting go of the breath, you're actually working with it. Look at those 16 steps of breath meditation. And they're basically lessons in how to develop happiness out of the breath, a sense of well-being, a sense of ease. from four different angles. Those sixteen steps fall into four tetrads. The first deals with the body, the second with feelings, the third with the mind, and the fourth with phenomena, or mental qualities. In each of the four steps, instead of just dropping things or running away, you're told to sensitize yourself to what you've got there. And as you get more sensitive to it, then the next lesson is lessons in how to develop a sense of ease within that sensitivity. So you're not blocking things out, you're actually making yourself more aware of what's going on from that particular angle. For example, you start out with the breath coming in, going out. You know when it's coming in long, know when it's going out long, coming in short, going out short. You sensitize yourself to the varieties of the breath and the longness and shortness of the breath. That's only one facet of the varieties that you find. It's deep breathing, shallow breathing, fast, slow, broad, narrow, heavy, light. You want to be sensitive to the different ways you breathe. And then as you get more sensitive to what kind of breathing feels good, then, or in order to get more sensitive to what breathing, kind of breathing really feels good for the body, you've got to make yourself aware of the whole body. You breathe in sensitive to the whole body, breathe out sensitive to the whole body. In other words, you get to know the breathing process as a totality. And then you allow the breathing to calm down, so it becomes gentler. There's less intentional fabrication, and the breath is allowed more to get more and more quiet, more subtle. As you allow the breath to get more subtle, there's a greater sense of fullness in the body. One way of inducing this, as I mentioned earlier, is that when you're breathing out, don't squeeze the body. Think of the body staying full even as the breath goes out. And it comes in again to induce even more fullness and more and more. So you're really beginning to notice that there's something special that you can do with the way you breathe. You can develop a sense of ease, a sense of well-being that's very full, very refreshing. So that's the pattern. You sensitize yourself to this and then you learn how to make it pleasurable. 
learn to do what's needed in order to make it a good place to be. Only then can you let it go. The next tetrad, working with feeling. Now that you've got the breath feeling comfortable, you sensitize yourself to that feeling of comfort. You don't focus directly on the comfort. You stay with the breath as your primary focus. You're training yourself with the breath, but you sensitize yourself to what ways of breathing or feeling easeful, pleasurable, which ones give rise to a sense of fullness, rapture, refreshment. And then you sensitize yourself not only to the, the feeling, but also to what the, the other, what they call mental sankhara, which is perception. The perceptions you have that induce pleasure, the perceptions you have that induce a sense of fullness. Which ways of visualizing the body, labeling the breath, understanding the breath are helpful, which ones are not? Which ones are agitating, which ones are calming? And then you go for the calming ones. So again, you follow the same pattern. You sensitize yourself to the process of feeling and perception, and then you allow it to become more calm. That's when you put it aside and start focusing directly on the mind. It's the sense of awareness, the knowingness that's been watching over the breath. Again, where are you going to find this knowingness? Well, right there at your awareness of the breath. And then you begin to notice sometimes it gets weak. It loses energy, so you find ways of gladdening it, to lift its spirits. Other times it feels shaky, so you find ways of steadying it, or may feel confined by one thing or another, so you find ways of liberating it from its confinement. So you get sensitive both to this quality of awareness and what you can do to put it in good shape. That's when you let go of that focus and you move on to just phenomena of, me of mental qualities in and of themselves. And you see how inconstant they are. This is sensitizing them, sen sensitizing yourself to them in a very deep level here. That even the really good mental qualities of the concentration, ease, rapture, they too are inconstant. They are fabricated. And this is when you start looking at them in terms of the, what are called the three characteristics, or more, more accurately, they're the three perceptions. These are the perceptions you apply. You look at them in terms of their inconstancy, in terms of the stress that's there, and to look at them in terms of not being yourself, not you, not yours, not really under your control. You can nudge them here and nudge them there. and exercise some measure of control over them, but ultimately they follow their own laws, which you have to respect. And when you're face to face with that, what do you do to find happiness? Well, you develop dispassion for them. Notice here that dispassion comes not out of anger or aversion, but simply the understanding that comes from mastery, from having really developed these things. That's when you allow things to fall the way into cessation, and then you just sort of return everything back to where it came from. You relinquish it. So the relinquishing comes not from aversion or from a desire to run away, but from having explored the full limits of what you've been focusing on. So with each of these four tetrads, it's a similar pattern. You sensitize yourself to what's going on. And then you find ways of finding happiness within that sensitivity. You expand your awareness rather than curling up and trying to hide. You let go not out of aversion, but out of a full understanding. 
having learned the lessons of happiness, learned the lessons of pleasure that you can develop from the breath. So even though we know that there are these three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not-self, as John Lee points out, first you take what's inconstant and you make it as constant as possible, a sense of ease and well-being. You take that sense of stress, or what is stressful, and learn how to find pleasure in the midst of all this. How far can you push the envelope? You take what's not self and you really make it yours through your mastery. That's the developing side. Once things are fully developed, then you let them go. So keep your mind to yourself, especially when the mind has this tendency to run, run away and be done with everything. That that's not the way the Buddha followed. The Buddha followed the path of exploring, cultivating, developing, letting go of what was unskillful, anything that he could sense that was a weight or a burden on the mind, and then going to deeper and deeper levels, from body, feelings, into the mind, the sense of awareness, the sense of knowing, and finally simply the level of mental qualities, things that can be known simply by watching with total equanimity. So you would ultimately relinquish even the equanimity. That's mature letting go. It comes from developing your sensitivity, learning the lessons of happiness, learning the lessons of pleasure that the breath has to offer. You look in the texts and you see that Breath meditation and the development of goodwill, the Brahma Viharas, are listed as separate techniques, but they really come together. In the process of working with the breath, you're learning lessons in how to make yourself happy, how to develop a sense of pleasure within. Once you have that sense of pleasure, that sense of well-being, then it's a lot easier to spread thoughts of goodwill in an unlimited way. Because if you're feeling put upon, feeling simply wanting to, the desire simply to run away, it's hard to wish happiness for anybody, much less happiness for all living beings unconditionally. But if you develop this sense of pleasure, the lessons and happiness that you can learn from the breath. One, you understand what happiness is all about until you've got it. You're in a position where you want to share, and you understand what you are doing when you wish happiness for other beings. You wish that they, too, could develop their inner resources. At the same time, you put the mind in a position where it can see where Goodwill is appropriate, where compassion is appropriate, empathetic joy, where equanimity are appropriate. In other words, you've learned from the breath that there are times when the breath is not feeling good and you're not feeling good. What can you do to alleviate that sense of stress and disease? There are times when it is going well, and you've got to learn how to appreciate that, keep it going. And then there are times you can't do anything just yet, so you've got to be patient. You've got to develop equanimity. When you can develop this sensitivity inside, it's a lot easier to be sensitive to conditions outside as well, as to when which of the different Brahma-viharas is appropriate. So these practices go together. This is why in the forest tradition there's no separate Brahma Vihara meditation. There are the chants we do. You can reflect every morning. As I say, John Munn did. Every morning when he woke up, he reflected on goodwill for all beings. In the afternoon, waking up from his nap, goodwill for all beings. At night, before he went to bed, goodwill for all beings. But the rest of the day was spent focused on the body, focused on the breath. And it was a seamless practice. It 
It's when you find yourself wanting to run away from the body or wanting to run away from your feelings. Remember, you can't run away from them until you've thoroughly developed them, until you've mastered them. You've learned the lessons and happiness that they have to offer. That's when your position where you can find a happiness that's even greater. We move from a sense of fullness to something that's even more gratifying. We move from fullness to fullness to the point where we don't need to be full anymore. You go to freedom. But it can't be done just by running away and saying things are bad, they're in constant stressful, no self, I want to be out of here. You have to take these things and turn them into a basis for happiness so that you're letting go, so that your liberation comes from not a sense of aversion, but a sense of enough. That's the only kind of liberation you can really trust.